So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ISPRS UG29 Meetup event. I'm Fabio Minna and together with Professor Max Shortis, Dr. Panagiotis Agrafiotis and Professor Dimitrios Carlatos, we're chairing the working group 29 of the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. The working group deals with underwater data acquisition and processing using photogrammetry and related uh, uh, disciplines, not only from the water, but also from up above, as it is the case, for example, of airborne multimedia photogrammetry and bathymetric uh, LiDAR. This is the second day of the event. Uh, yesterday, we had 16 very interesting presentations in the, in the uh, day of uh, uh, the uh, World Oceans Day. Uh, yesterday was the, the United Nations Awards, uh, uh, World Oceans Day, uh, which leads up a decade of, uh, of um, uh, ocean science for sustainable development. And I think that uh, we, we gave a very uh, nice message yesterday uh, with, uh, with uh, many participants from uh, worldwide. We were about uh, 21 countries. Uh, we then uh, uh, had the 16 very interesting presentations followed by interactive discussion using the Slido tool. Uh, then at the end of the of the presentation, uh, we left the slide or question and answer uh, open uh, all the day, and actually the participants kept discussing even after the end of the live event. Uh, last presentation of yesterday uh, uh, opened uh, uh, left with an open question, and uh, one of the participants uh, left very interesting comments uh, and useful information on the on the chat. I then uh, yesterday very briefly um, um, say that uh, um, it's very important for us to be here together because uh, cooperation is the most important thing in, uh, in if we really want to help the oceans. And that in, uh, in case uh, uh, this uh, brings, uh, takes to, to important uh, publications, to important out research outcomes, uh, I, I would invite you to, to consider all the ISPRS uh, uh, publications channels. Uh, but also I mentioned that uh, as we are a very active um, working group, there are always a lot of uh, different uh, possibilities for the, for the members to publish their work uh, uh, in, uh, in special issues or in uh, uh, other workshops. So uh, you, if you are interested, you can, uh, you can then uh, look for this information in the video recording that, uh, that we will publish or ask directly the, 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 the participants. Um, now, um, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, give a few instructions for, uh, for the meeting. Uh, as uh, we said, uh, as we did yesterday, uh, we will have uh, several uh, presentations, one after the other. Uh, some are a bit uh, longer, some are just pitch presentation. We have grouped them in, uh, in a few of them for uh, 30 minutes uh, presentation and uh, followed by 10 minutes uh, question and answer. So you can, uh, you can use the, the Slido tool, which you can access if you have a QR uh, reader on your uh, mobile phone, or you can just uh, uh, click on the link. I, uh, pasted on the on the Google Meet chat. Um, what else? Uh, if you use the question and answer, uh, please um, address the the question to the specific uh, speaker. Uh, we will use the Google Meet chat only for technical communications. Um, and uh, in case I don't know, somebody can't hear. Uh, uh, the, the speaker well, or there are other problems, uh, other technical problems. So as we did yesterday, just to check that everybody, we have 42 connected right now, uh, I will stop uh, presenting this uh, PowerPoint here, and I will try to share the other screen, um, the other screen, this one from uh, the Slido. Uh, this is what, uh, as what left from the from the discussion yesterday, um, I would uh, start with the first poll. Um, uh, for those who already uh, voted yesterday, uh, uh, you you may skip this. So the just to check, we we are we are in uh, 33 people yesterday. So please, if you uh, 
if I don't know if you're able to vote. Let's do it again. Okay, you can see that the, the counter on the upper right corner is increasing. So that means that uh, uh, many uh, people were successful with that. That's okay. I mean, if you are in trouble with, uh, with this uh, Slido, please just uh, uh, send me a message and I'll try to help you privately. Um, so I think that uh, that's, uh, that's everything I needed to, to say. And uh, we can move to the first uh, speaker, who is uh, Kevin Koser um, from the Oceanic Machine Vision Group of the Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean, uh, Ocean Research. Um, Kevin is going to give uh, a long presentation on the, um, on the group activities. Uh, Kevin, whenever you're ready, uh, just uh, take the screen. Kevin, are you there? Yes. Okay. Can Can you hear me? Oh yes, loud can, and can, clear. Can you also see the slides in the full screen now? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Perfect. Okay, then. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, also for giving me the opportunity to, to introduce the Oceanic Machine Vision Group at GEOMAR. GEOMAR, um, if you don't know, it's a public research center in Germany. So we are located in the Baltic, at the Baltic Sea uh, coast in the north of Germany. And uh, GEOMAR has like thousand employees and um, basically working in all oceans and all ocean disciplines. And the Oceanic Machine Vision Group was founded two years ago. And the idea is to basically enable quantitative imaging and machine vision for the, for the deep ocean and for the ocean sciences. I'll show you in a moment a few applications. So I'm not going to read all of them. Um, we have currently two postdocs, three PhD students, and three master's students also here, if you're interested. And then I'll just go over to the, to the topics. So why do we need, um, let's say, deep ocean vision? So basically, you know, if we look at the map of the world, the Earth is actually an ocean planet. And more of ha than half of the Earth is located more than 1,000 meters in the ocean. And um, as you know, in the top 200 meters here, if we look to the top right, can you see my mouse, actually? I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I, I, I do. We can oh. see it. Okay. So in the top 200 meters, we have the photic zone where we have light. But if we go deeper, then we have high pressure and low temperatures, no light. And so it means that most of the seafloor has never been seen by any human, basically. And if we want to see it, we have to go very close. So this is a, um, one of our robots in 100 meter water depth. And you need to bring your light source, get close to the seafloor. And um, you can see it has difficult visibility conditions if we want to map or measure there. <clears throat> and on the next slide, I'll have a few examples what other image material or videos we record and what other scenarios like rising, rising gas bubble, quantification. This is a deep sea mining scenario. I'll come to that later. Cold water corals, black smokers, which you can see the smoke also, and also dump munition in the Baltic Sea. And, and all of them have certain challenges let's say and we start with an example from this deep sea mining where we want to map the ocean floor in four kilometer water depth and you can see we have to bring a light source and you have this bluish appearance and you see the light cone and what we actually want to do is make maps out of it but the light is um, let's say annoying and so i don't want to give a technical talk here just to give you an idea so we basically decompose this image into an illumination estimate and an albedo estimate and then once we have that we can just project the albedos back to the seafloor and then we can generate larger scale maps from it and you can see for instance here in this composed 
map, then you see structures which are not that much visible in these in um, original images because they are kind of overlaid by the water and light artifacts, let's say. We can make 3D models. I'm, I'm skipping over it here. And I just want to briefly mention what's the issue in the deep sea. So we need really, we need a um, good housing, let's say with 600 bar pressure, thick glass and so on. So the water properties are different in the deep sea and the sea surface. And we have to bring the light source and it has to be close to the camera because it has to be mounted on the robot. And so we get a lot of scattering. We have no diver, no chessboard, no marker, no GPS. And we have moving shadows, light cones in the water, and all of that makes it quite difficult to, to do photogrammetry in the deep sea. And the robot needs two hours to dive down and two hours to come back. So it's better you set the camera parameters properly. Otherwise, the day, otherwise the, the day is wasted, more or less. So for some examples, we take also in the surrounding of Kiel. So this is in the Kiel Fjord. This is one of our shallow water small AUVs. We take pictures like, like this here. We set the white balance to very reddish, so we don't lose so much uh, red information. Then we can estimate what's the scatter component, what's the light cone at the seafloor. And if you undo this, um, then basically you can get um, 3D models which are in some way color corrected. It's not yet perfect, but still um, it's useful to, to correct it. Another application is that we can cluster image data from visual emissions, so you get a quick overview what's, how did it look like um, during this maybe one or multiple hour photo mapping campaign. Another thing, this was a master thesis last year, is uh, segmentation and free space detection. We want to learn what's the, what's the water color, let's say, and where can we move with the robot and where is actually the structure, so we can use it also for photogrammetry to exclude these parts um, which are in the water so we don't get noise and spurious matches there. Time-lapse photography from landers is also one application. So put this big lander here on the seafloor for a couple of weeks or months or so, and then you can see what's moving there, how fast is it moving and, and things like that. And one important thing for all of that is that we have calibrated our cameras because um, you're all aware that um, there is the refraction problem. If the light changes between different media, then basically the light can change direction. So if we look into a fish tank aquarium here, let's say the water level is up to here, you can see the feet of this guy are much wider. And then if we fill the aquarium further, it's so the water level is up to here, you can see underwater, it's like a little bit like a zoom in effect, but it's not zoom in, it's refraction and it's depth dependent and we have to consider it, otherwise we get biased reconstruction. And typically uh, many people use these flat port housings with a flat glass interface. And there is whole theory of how to consider the refraction and thick ports and, and so on. But we've recently also looked into the dome port system. So the dome is a spherical housing. And then basically the idea is that if you put your camera in the center, then there is no refraction. So it's, it's, it's very nice. And basically you can have larger field of view. It sustains the water pressure better. It's, it's mechanically more stable. But in practice, your camera is not in the center of the dome. It's actually somewhere where you mounted it because it's very difficult to see where is the center of your dome and where is your camera center and so on. So what we looked into here is for instance if you move your camera forward and backward inside the dome then you can see here at the boundary so this is above water this is below water in our tank you can see that the straight lines are interrupted here and we don't want the situation like this in the top right or in the middle here but we want actually our camera to be positioned such that there is no refraction like here. And then you can do it up to maybe one millimeter accuracy or so. And the rest you can still calibrate using some chessboard bundle adjustment approach. So you know what's exactly this offset. Another topic is I'm um, really going fast through all the topics we can discuss later if you have questions physics-based simulation. So here we're using ray tracing basically to simulate what's the light. So this is the sunlight and the shallow water scenario. In the deep sea, we have artificial light sources. 
in the key fjord for instance let in 10 20 meters dist, um, depth we have a mix of of different phenomena and simulating it is is very useful for testing algorithms for evaluation and also for some other um, applications for instance if for our deep sea robot we have 24 leds but in which direction should we point them it's not an easy task and as i said it takes two hours to dive down so be it's better if you have positioned your light sources in a, in a good way so we can basically simulate the lighting and what's the pattern that we can um, expect on the seafloor and then one more application is the bubble box so we characterize rising gas bubbles from the seafloor so this is the box we can see it here and we put it just on the seafloor you can see that here this is from one or two years ago the gas rises through the box we have a stereo camera and then we can track and match the bubbles and get bubble size distributions rise speeds and things like that and last but not least i also would like to take the opportunity to um, announce the workshop fabio thanks for mentioning it already um, so submission is open for a new underwater vision or photogrammetry methods until end of june and you can you can go to the workshop website and and, and see more details there and with that, I would like to conclude. And yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks, Alf, Kevin, for this uh, very interesting presentation, interesting overview. Uh, I would uh, move to the next speaker, which is uh, John Wood. Uh, jo John uh, is working at the Archaeology Center, University of Malta, and together with Kari Itinen, uh, they are working together on very interesting projects in uh, underwater. Um, John is going to give a, a quick uh, presentation on Virtual Underwater Museum of Malta. Uh, please, John, uh, whenever you're okay. ready, you can take your screen. Right, okay. I'll uh, just load the presentation and share my screen. Let's see. Uh, It's uh, down on the left of uh... Yeah. Okay, can you uh, see the screen? Uh, it's, yes. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, wait, I'll start by a quick introduction. Uh, as, far, as you mentioned, I, I, I am a technical diver and uh, also I do work on 3D modeling for the University of Malta and for Heritage Malta. Um, uh, for the last um, three years, roughly, and uh, I'm joined by my colleague Kari. So, I want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Kari Rutten. I come from Hanselik, Finland, and for the last uh, five, six years, uh, mostly I've been doing my diving and uh, 3D photography work here in, in, in the Maltese waters. I guess I got enough for the turbidity of the Gulf of Finland. <laughs> So, um, we're going to talk actually about two projects very briefly. And so, we're going to basically combine our, 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 present, our two slots into one, uh, let's say, it's like a longer presentation, if that's all right. Um, so, the two projects are the Virtual Museum, uh, which was launched last year, and uh, the Phoenician Shipwreck Project, uh, deep water excavation uh, project on, on, on the Phoenician Shipwreck. Um, now, I think it's important to state that our, let's say, the, the innovative part that we feel of what we're doing isn't so much the, the, the photogrammetry process itself. You know, we apply tools which exist, we learn how they work, we try to improve our workflows to, to make better use of tools which exist. However, I think the environment and the depths in which we work uh, is, is probably something which, uh, which could be of, of more interest. So, uh, I'll talk a bit about the uh, introduce the Underwater Malta. It's a website um, which showcases Malta's underwater cultural heritage um, riches. Um, it's, it's, it's intended for general public and for divers. So far we have 15 wrecks on the site, uh, more are in progress. And uh, on all, on all uh, the, the content, the photogrammetry models are, are really centered to, to, to the presentation and to the communication of the wrecks. And, and, and of the information we're presenting here. So we use the photogrammetry models 
you know, for, for obviously for, for display as you're seeing, for uh, VR experience, you know, by loading them on, on sites such as Sketchfab, for creating uh, visual fly-throughs of the Rex. So uh, it's proved quite popular. We get a lot of hits on this site, um, both, both kind of the general public and, and divers as well. Now we're at a stage where we can say all the say, easy Rex have been done, all the shallower Rex have been done. So now we're focusing on Rex which are deeper, from 65 down to 120 meters, uh, and also larger, uh, 80 meters to 150 meters in length. Now, obviously, deep is a relative term, especially you know having seen the last presentation. Um, but know that all our that all our photogrammetry is done by divers, um, uh, you know, um, so not by not by ROVs or some other kind of machines. So so even down to the depths we're talking, and that's I think where we're going to focus this presentation. We're also uh, looking at, uh, now starting off the summer, quite a large project, uh, creating a, a photogrammetric, photogrammetric model of a large amphora field of about 120,000 square meters at 100 meters depth. So that's something that is, like, say, our next, our next challenge. And this will be probably a project that will take multiple seasons for the next few years, keeping us busy, you know, over, over a month every summer or so. So one example of these recent treks that we've been doing is the HMS Urge. It's uh, on the seabed at 110 meters. Um, so that requires a dive time of around two and a half hours. Uh, all the divers will be on rebreathers, uh, as I'm sure you will appreciate. And uh, for this kind of dives, you know, obviously teamwork and safety are, are paramount. So to do this particular model required a number of dives with a number of teams, very close coordination, safety divers, surface support, the works really um, because of the depths you know we'll be working at. But obviously, as you, you know, we're quite pleased with the results we're managing to get. And here we can see uh, a couple of uh, auto projections of that same wreck projected on top of the uh, blueprint of of the U-class submarine, which this is. And here we can see even. In terms of the, let's say, geometric um, um, scaling uh, result of the model, uh, we feel it's 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 quite quite a good job, quite accurate, quite an accurate job. So moving on, uh, introduction to the Phoenician shipwreck project. Uh, now this is a slightly different type of project. It's uh, an excavation happening on a site which is 2,700 years old, first discovered around 30 years ago. And over the last three years, both Gary and myself have been both part of the team uh, doing the excavation and documentation of, of, this, of this shipwreck, of this very interesting and unique shipwreck. It, it is located at 108 meters. Uh, to our knowledge, at least, it is the deepest site anywhere in the world on which such a, let's say, a rigorous and coordinated and disciplined excavation is, is being carried out. So photogrammetry in this case, obviously we use well beyond the, the let's say, the pretty, pretty models that, that, that we can see um, for, the, for the underwater museum, um, uh, but we're using photogrammetry now for very, very rigorous documentation of the site. So the, the process that we adopt is that every day, um, sorry, every season, we take a full site um, photogrammetric scan at the beginning and at the end of the, of the season. Uh, we're focusing the excavation on a, on a small area, four by two. The whole site is, I think, about 20 by 12, yeah. something like that, 20 by 12 meters. So we're focusing the excavation on a very small site, four by two meters. And every day, well, at least every day that there is some uh, disturbance of the site, myself or Kari, either together or with other, 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 other support divers, we go down and take the data to develop a photogrammetric model. So each day we can then um, uh, keep, keep, keep that, uh, keep that uh, consistently documented. Um, we're using a scaling system, a uh, local scaling system, uh, for, for the site, uh, we've set up uh, initially at the beginning of uh, the season three years ago, the let's say baseline model and capturing and creating the uh, local coordinate system. And every every dive, then we match up with that with that coordinate system uh, using a set of, of scales and a set of targets, which 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 we manage kind of from year to year to remain consistent uh, with with the initial 
uh, years um, captured. So this is the kind of output that we produce on a daily basis. So this is, for example, the output of 2019. Anyway, it's just uh, um, uh, the first first day and then subsequent days. So each day we take, you know, as we said, a model, and then we allows us to do a comparative analysis or versus either the previous day or versus the, the, the first day of the season or, or versus uh, any other model really that we have created um, previously. And obviously, the archaeologists then find this very useful to understand then the depths at which uh, items have been um, uh, lifted from. Uh, it allows them to plan then the next day's work, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here's a, a little video of the site itself, and um, uh, there's a diver uh, who, like myself, Okari, actually, probably. You, it's me, okay, um, doing a, a scan of the site. You can see the site is bounded by the, that uh, rigid grid. And you can see also the, the equipment we use to create the targets and to do the white balancing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it from me. Um, I hope that's a quick introduction uh, to, to the site. So I'll hand over to Kari now to talk about how the challenges yeah, as as uh, it's already mentioned, uh, the, uh, all the all, almost all the project sites lie in, in quite a deep waters. Uh, so the biggest problem is that the data capture must be done in a very short time. And all the depth uh, means that we are carrying a lot of equipment. We have long uh, diving time. So typically, uh, the bottom time for a 100 or 120 meter dive is 10, 15 minutes maximum, and that already leads to a three or four hour total dive time. So we can say that uh, 120 meters is kind of a practical limit for, for diver-based uh, data capture. Uh, just uh, uh, a couple of words about uh, what we have been doing for the last, or, or in, in which way we have been doing the data capture in, in the, in the uh, few years. So we actually started with HD video, but now we have moved to using high-res raw stills and also in some cases, especially in, in bad visibility in, in Gulf of Finland, I would uh, still be using perhaps high-res raw video. Uh, scooter mounting has been a very, very big thing for us because uh, that allows us to cover large wrecks in depth and uh, it's not only a question of uh, the short time, but it's only also a question of we, we cannot uh, work hard on those depths, it will be very, very uh, dangerous and difficult. So in, in the bigger bigger wrecks, we are also uh, investigating ways of uh, using navigation aids. For example, Peretti was yesterday telling about the UVIS system, and that's something that we will be also using now in a big, big project, which is uh, uh, coming this year. Uh, and here is one example. Uh, John already uh, showed the urge. This is a very good example of a uh, wreck in deep waters, and we can use scooter-based uh, cameras and also handheld uh, cameras. The whole point is that without scooter-based cameras, we wouldn't be able to cover this kind of wrecks in, in that uh, kind of depths. So, for example, this one is based on 3,400 images uh, done in, in three dives using high-res uh, skills. And a couple of words, what we actually would like to like to see happening, because we uh, we are doing, I could say, two kinds of projects. The first one is uh, is the virtual museum, which is all about uh, visualization. And in that case, we are not that interested in, or it's not that necessary to have exact uh, uh, exact geometric geometric uh, model. Just the it should be visually good. But uh, for example, in the in the Phoenician wreck, we, we really need sub centimeter uh, or sub millimeter accuracy to be able to uh, to see the progress of the uh, excavation daily daily. So we are we would like to have a very quick method of camera calibration. Perhaps uh, we will be trying using stereo cameras, and we also would like to have uh, access to multi beam systems so that we could actually have a, like a like a baseline for, for the bigger wrecks so that we could combine multi beam generated data to photogrammetry. And also ROV could be used in, in certain bigger sites. And uh, of course, for visualization, we would also like to have 
better uh, color correction and, and perhaps algorithms that would get rid of uh, the big color, color differences in the, in the models. But that's all for us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, John and Kari. Uh, a very incredible work you're doing down there. Thanks a lot. Uh, next uh, speaker would be Professor Chiara Petrioli, but I think uh, uh, she couldn't manage to, to join us in the end. Uh, she said she was not sure because of uh, other commitments. Uh, so I think uh, if Erika is there and uh, re she's ready and uh, she wants to, to share her screen, okay, you're there. Hi, Erika. Please, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. I found it. So yes, give me just a moment to find the. In the meantime, I can uh, uh, remind uh, the participants to 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 use the Slido question and answer tool and uh, make uh, questions to the to the speakers if they want. And also that uh, the poll is active, so they should be able to to vote. Okay, can you see my presentation? Uh, uh, actually, not yet. Okay. Ah, I might have some connection issues, so I'm going to switch off my camera. Okay, my, this might help, maybe. And and then, no, not, not, not yet. Uh, if you want, uh, we may uh, let uh, Fabio Benvenuti start uh, his presentation and uh, yes, come you... back to you later. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, Thanks. sure. Thanks, sorry for that. So, Fabio, if you're ready uh, to share your screen. Yeah, uh, I don't need to, to share my screen. I need only to... Uh, to talk, to explain, and little much. Oh, share yourself do. then. <laughs> okay, I I have this is my screen. No, it's my table. Hello, thank you at all. Thank you for um, the opportunity. I am Fabio Benvenuti. I am the owner of Easy Dive. Uh, only I have a very short presentation. Thank you to Fabio for the opportunity. And uh, our company, Science on the Two Thousand, is about twenty-one years that we development the housing for uh, underwater camera uh, is very technology housing no we we have a lot of uh, collaboration on this year and also with uh, john and karin to malta and other company we have development our housing for the photogrammetry function uh, now with john and uh, and, uh, and the malta museum we have had uh, the photogrammetry function on our universal housing the very big advantage of, the, of our housing is uh, that our housing is uh, is not dedicated for a, a, a model of camera, but you can put inside many different model of camera, uh, Sony, Panasonic, uh, Canon, and uh, a lot of different brands. Um, another housing that we have development is very important uh, is the, the housing for the smartphone and for the tablet. It's in aluminium and in, in, in this, you, is universal. Inside, you can fix uh, a lot of model of smartphone and tablet. And with this, we have also development with the university, with the 3D research, Fabio Bruno, and uh, um, a very nice project for uh, uh, also the, um, the, uh, the virtual uh, underwater 3D. Um, yes, only for, explain that uh, our factory is very our company is very um, uh, disposal to uh, continue to uh, to make a new a, a development of our housing have a new project new idea and uh, for uh, all the participants if you have an idea for uh, add the other function or uh, use uh, our uh, our housing our uh, um, our job, we can ask directly from us and we can give all our support and our experience. This is uh, 
everything. This is that we have uh, do on this year for uh, for the photogrammetry, for uh, the the 3D, for uh, the um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, project, a lot of project, and. Um, I think so. We, we produce also the light system, a lot of uh, accessory components, also the mount system for the DPV for the for take the photogrammetry, and uh, uh, we think is uh, is uh, is is all for for my small presentation, <laughs> for my quick presentation, and uh, thanks also for the opportunity. And uh, we are here, easy dive. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Fabio. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know if uh, Erika um, wants to, to try again. Yeah, let, let's try again. Thank you so much, Fabio. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Okay, okay looks like uh, something Just... is happening here. Oh, yes. Good. Ah, no. Now it's working. Super. Uh, we see PowerPoint, yes. So, is the presentation start, starting? Uh, we still see the PowerPoint with the the slides, thumbnails on the left. I don't know if. Uh... Okay, so that's I'm going to to continue this way. If it's okay for for yeah, you. try try just to maximize. So, maybe. Uh, I think this is the maximum we can have. Okay. So I hope you can <laughs> see the uh, my, my slide. And so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Fabio, and the organizer for this nice event and this opportunity. So I'm Erika Nocerino, and I'm current, currently postdoc in the group of Pierre Dra in Marseille. And Piotr and my colleague uh, the, the, uh, Bertrand Szymiski are going to discuss more in detail some, some activities we are currently uh, working on in our uh, lab. So I take this opportunity, I will try to, to be brief, but I take this opportunity to discuss with you of some experiences, research experiences, uh, I have been lucky to to do during this um, last year so with so many colleagues uh, around the world. So um, basically, we started uh, studying uh, the, 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 the environment where we are operating, operating the underwater environment, and also uh, the, the systems uh, that we use to understand the, their potentialities and their drawbacks. And so we tested several camera systems uh, from low cost uh, to professional grade cameras in uh, operation, operational settings and in the many different, uh, for many different applications and needs. We then uh, delved into the, um, the, 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 the study of flatted dome ports. We all know that these are the two types of ports uh, that we have in front of our cameras, and they affect uh, the, the, the image formation, so the quality and also the achievable accuracy. So we studied uh, both flat and dome ports in, uh, um, in the real environment and also with simulation. So as I was saying, uh, starting from the study of flat and dome ports and their effect of, uh, on uh, image quality with the into the, the effect of uh, uh, refraction uh, and uh, the, the residual systematic errors that um, uh, they are caused by refraction, both in simulations and in real case scenario. And in this regard, I invite you all to, to participate uh, in the poster session in the next uh, ISPRS event, uh, virtual event in July, where we are going to um, to discuss about the, the last works we have done in this, uh, on this topic. And then another, uh, another topic is uh, the development of uh, a procedure to propagate all the uncertainty uh, from measurement uh, and also modeling uh, effects to the full photogrammetric approach. This is very crucial when the aim of the application is to detect significant changes 
over time. So you have two models basically uh, in two different uh, epochs and you want to compare them in order to understand if something has changed. So um, the, it's crucial to understand the, the, the changes that uh, you measure are really due to, to real changes or to errors in the measurement and uh, uh, modeling uh, procedure. And we basically applied all this study in uh, in several projects, but especially in one uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, an ongoing project we have uh, in um, French Polynesia in uh, Morea, where we um, developed we we applied this procedure to coral reef monitoring. We have several plots there of different size uh, characteristics uh, depths. And uh, we also implemented um, rigorous geodetic approaches in order to have a temporal stable reference system. We know this is, that this is something uh, uh, crucial, but it's also something cum cumbersome. So what we are currently working on is uh, a, a lighter procedure if you want to characterize the quality of uh, photogra uh, the photogrammetry photogrammetric models and in particular with, with PF for example we are now developing an interactive visualization tool in order to visualize all the elements of the bundle adjustment and the results and their quality metrics and also with um, other colleagues we are um, working on a, a smart procedure for obtaining a um, surveying and 3D modeling of the underwater environment um, trying to alleviate the need for reference um, control in a such a changing and difficult environment. And uh, uh, on this, uh, Fabio is going to, um, to provide more details. So I thank you all and sorry again for all the troubles with uh, my connection. Uh, no problem, Erika. Uh, uh, I would then uh, move to the question and answer session. Let's see, let me share my screen with the Slido um, pres yes, present mode. Can you see it? It's uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the most rated question was for uh, Kevin. Uh, and uh, the question is, that, do you compensate for what is scattering and absorption? And if yes, how do you do it? Do you take measurements or use predefined values? Uh, Kevin, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, um, okay. So what I've shown um, it was like our first attempt to do it. So we we use a mix of a lighting model and uh, like really camera and light propagation model underwater. But when we were looking at the flat sea floor with the robot always constant altitude, constant attenuation, then actually the scattering and the light cone, it's always constant. So it's quite easy to estimate it from an image sequence. So this was an image-based approach. But, and it works only for the really flat sea floor with the dominant color, let's say, where you can say, oh, on average, it's brown. But at the moment, we are working both on parametric models where you really estimate uh, what's the field of view of the light source, what's the water scattering, what's the water attenuation. Um, but for complex systems, for big systems, it can become too complicated. So we're also looking into more, let's say, statistical models. So both ways we look into, but it's not yet, um, it's not yet published or finished. We're still working on, on some methods for that. Thank you. Uh, I would move to Erika's question for uh, John. Except for, for Schlendi, how do you scale the photogrammetric models of the RECs you survey? Okay. Um, well, we, with RECs, which are, let's say, in the 50 to 70, 80 meter depth, then we do take down scales. Uh, you know, we play scales, you know, as a team would play scales on the seabed around the rack, and we take them into the model and use that for scaling. And as Kari said, also, precise scaling for the underwater museum isn't that essential and we can also use things like uh, blueprints then to apply a scale from a blueprint you know uh, which are which obviously we have uh, exact measurements um, but for the deeper X then it gets more difficult you know there's just isn't the time for someone to place a scale on the seabed 
to wait until that's done. You know, you, you know, you just need to basically use all the time you have to gather data, and and that's the approach we take. And then we try to figure out scaling afterwards. It could be from a gun turret, for example, where we know the measurements from 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 the from, and then use that to apply it to the rest of the of, of the site. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, we're a bit late, uh, so I invite you to use the question tool uh, also to answer to the questions uh, so that we can uh, move to the next session. Uh, then, Panos, if you're ready and you, I will hang over mm -hmm. to you. I am ready. Okay, am ready. so um, before, uh, before, uh, um, I would like to uh, start a new poll. So let's see what was the result uh, here. Uh, something is not working right now, but let's start with the other poll. Um, that's um, a question for you. Um, yesterday there was a very uh, interesting discussion about uh, if uh, you're uh, uh, willing to, uh, you're interested in uh, contributing with the benchmark data set. If you already have some uh, data set that you want to share, um, please just, uh, we'll find probably, uh, we will do some discussion later and uh, we will let you know how, how to uh, contribute. So I will hand uh, over to you, um, Panos. Whenever you're ready, you can take the screen. Thanks. Yes, good yes, afternoon well, from my side uh, to this second uh, section and we will start the presentations from Mr. Rastam Jahangir from uh, Blue Robotics and he will give us a long presentation on visual inspection and monitoring the screen is yours. All right, thank you very much and uh, thank you everybody for having me here. <clears throat> I'll try to keep it straightforward so that we can move forward. Um, <clears throat> can everybody can everybody see my screen fine? Yeah, but only uh, blue screen. Okay, yeah, it's fine. All right, my name is Rusty Jahunger. I'm the founder and CEO of Blue Robotics. We're in California, uh, and we build components for marine robotics. Uh, <clears throat> We have 48 team members right now. Uh, you can check out our website at blueroboticscom And <clears throat> the company was founded in 2014, so about seven years old, with a mission to provide low cost, high quality components to enable the future of marine robotics. Uh, many of which are now being used in uh, photogrammetry applications, uh, some very, very cool applications that we're proud of. Uh, I just wanna give you a little bit about our background, what we do and uh, share our newest product and I'll keep it short. So uh, this company started as a hobby project for me. I, I had this crazy idea when I was bored to, why not to make a solar powered surfboard and send it from Los Angeles to Hawaii. <clears throat> you know, from Los Angeles here in California, uh, 4,000 kilometers to Hawaii, two, that would take two to three months at walking pace, which is what I figured a surfboard could do with solar panels on it. Uh, and I started working on this crazy idea. I was going to make it GPS guided, have a computer, have a satellite radio so I could talk to it, have solar panels, have a compass to guide it, temperature and pH measurements so it's doing something useful, and two thrusters to propel it. Uh, <clears throat> and I started working on this. It was easy to find all of these elements here uh, on a hobbyist budget, and then got to the thrusters and couldn't find anything that would last for two to three months in the ocean and could propel this and was anywhere close to affordable for me. Um, and so pivoted from this idea to, uh, you know, why don't we create a better, less expensive thruster? We found a lot of people online who were looking for the same thing. And so in 2014, we did that. We built this T200 thruster here, which I think is a basic building block for marine robotics. Uh, and we made it small, efficient, multi-purpose, well-documented, and about 10 times cheaper than anything else that was on the market at the time. Um, we did a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign in 2014, raised $100,000 and sold our first 600 thrusters. Uh, today we've sold, I think, over 60,000 thrusters uh, to people all over the world. Uh, 
<clears throat> and I realized after creating that thruster that there wasn't just a need for those thrusters, but for all components in marine robotics uh, to enable applications like a lot of what's going on here, um, where you just need tools. And if it's too expensive, then it's going to prevent people from moving forward. So we expanded our product line to have about 250 products in it now. We have the thruster, of course, but we added a series of watertight enclosures, uh, lights, cables, communication, electronics, sensors, batteries, pressure sensors, uh, manipulators, and uh, our, our flagship product is right here. This is called the Blue ROV2. It's a remotely operated underwater vehicle that primarily uses all of these components. You can see the thrusters on there, uh, the enclosures, the lights, um, and it's been a very popular ROV platform. Uh, I'll show you a couple, I won't go through, through all of these in detail, but a couple of my favorite applications. Uh, this is a deep sea drop cam built by a secondary school student to uh, film at a thousand meter water depth, take time lapse photos. Uh, there's a few surface vessels here and student ROVs. Um, this is a blue ROV2 being used for autonomous systems research at Woods Hole Institute of Oceanography. Uh, and this one is particularly relevant here. This is from a customer uh, in Australia named Abyss Solutions. Uh, and they do uh, metrology work with the Blue ROV2. They've got a camera system down here. They have strobe lights uh, so that they can provide really intense illumination synced up with the camera frame rate. Um, and they've made a bunch of other additions to this vehicle for their application. And then one of my favorites here is this one in Florida, which is being uh, being used for lionfish invasive species capture. Uh, it's basically a blue RV2, but they've built this big lionfish vacuum on it to suck up lionfish. Uh, <clears throat> our products generally are low cost. We shoot for them to be about five to 10 times less expensive than other options. Um, that's particularly true for our thrusters, our enclosures, our sensors, uh, most of our products. We try very hard to have openly, openly available information and documentation. So we have clear documentation on all of our products. We share all of the specifications. We share CAD models, open source firmware and software uh, as much as possible to make it easy to modify. All of our designs are intended to be highly expandable and highly user modifiable. Uh, we strongly encourage that. Um, and we even provide some accessories like a payload skid for the Blue RV2 to, to provide extra room for expansion. Uh, we have online community forums and support. There are thousands of users there participating and collaborating, sharing cool applications and the results of their dives. And last, we have a value-added distributor network worldwide. Uh, we have around 55 distributors. Most of them can actually help with modifications and customizations if you're not comfortable with that, um, but you're looking for something special. So you can check out a map here. I know a lot of you are in Europe right now uh, with quite a few distributors around there. <clears throat> and then this is my last slide. I just wanna share our most recent product. We announced this yesterday. It's called the Wetlink Penetrator. And <clears throat> uh, the, the pen cable, a cable penetrator is one of the most popular products in our product line. Passes an electrical cable from out in the water into a dry enclosure and this New penetrator here has no potting compound. Um, <clears throat> it's very easy to assemble. It just takes a minute or two to put one together. It has a 950 meter depth rating, which will help us push the limits of all of our products uh, to deeper depths. Uh, very low cost, about $12 USD each. Uh, and we are first selling this for cable diameters between six to 6.5 millimeters, but uh, we'll have sizes available for cables between four to nine millimeters. Um, and this is just our newest product, so I wanted to share that. And that's, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And um, let's move forward to the next presenter, uh, Mr. Alessio Galanopio. He's a PhD student at the Politecnico di Torino and the Department of Architecture and Design, and he will give us a pitch presentation about the group activities. Alessio, please. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And uh, uh, Alessio, just to... a moment. Uh, Rasti, can you please yes. stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Alessio, can you share your screen now? 
Can you see the screen? Yeah, okay. But you are not okay, in I'm the... trying to go full screen. Is it working? Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. So as, as uh, Panos, thank you for the introduction. So I am a PhD student from uh, uh, Politecnico di Torino in Italy. Um, I started working with underwater just last year, uh, especially with, for, my, for my PhD thesis, but I'm going also to present some group activities that uh, I do with uh, colleagues. Um, as you can see here, uh, we are a, a very big group of uh, geomatics, actually from two different labs. Uh, one is, is from my department, which is Department of Ar Architecture and Design. And uh, we also collaborate with the uh, Department of uh, Environment, Land and Infrastructure Engineering. Um, both of the two departments and the two labs are part of an uh, um, interdepartmental uh, uh, center, which especially care of service robotics. And we do also some, uh, some activities together uh, regarding the underwater topics. Um, so what do we do? Uh, actually, we do have uh, some uh, national and international cooperation. We started in 2019 uh, um, with the uh, National Park Service Submerged Resources Center of the uh, United States uh, with the, uh, let's say, fine-tuning of some uh, uh, suboptimal data set of some shipwrecks in, uh, in Florida. And then uh, last year, we moved to Apulia to do uh, documentation in very shallow water of uh, uh, ancient Roman shipwreck of uh, imperial uh, era. Um, concerning also my PhD, my PhD, I'm planning to have an experience abroad in the framework of the Erasmus uh, program uh, with the professor Dimitrios Carlatos in, uh, in Cyprus. Uh, so what we do uh, mainly is underwater photogrammetry for the documentation of uh, archaeological evidences. Uh, as you can see here, we, we do use an hybrid approach, so we do use some uh, different sensor. Uh, so the results is always the achievement of orthophotos and the digital relation model that allows the, the archaeologists to uh, un better understand uh, and study the, the heritage. Uh, but uh, we do have also some, we are also investing in uh, some hardware, let's say some platform to uh, have a more accurate uh, uh, results, especially related to positioning. So we recently bought, bought uh, a water linked underwater GPS, which works on short, base like, short baseline acoustic. And of course, we are trying to mix this approach. So we don't just rely on it, but we uh, are trying to uh, use an hybrid approach. So we use different sensors that are on board of uh, our, our Blue Rob 2 um, in order to reach the most accurate uh, um, positioning as, as possible. Um, sorry, another, another kind of uh, activity that we are uh, trying to, uh, to do as a... Um, uh, let's say as a forecast of the activities that we are trying to do with the big for ser uh, um, interdepartmental center is working with artificial intelligence to uh, reach uh, automatic or semi uh, automatic uh, um, uh, navigation of of the vehicle and uh, also rely on uh, some so surface uh, um, surface instrument that can also triangulate and also uh, help improving the positioning of the of the rov and uh, of course, uh, uh, we are also uh, aiming, uh, this is uh, what I'm showing uh, right now, is just a project that we proposed to the um, Ministry of uh, Education and Research in Italy. It's not an active project, so we are still uh, waiting for evaluation. At, uh, and it will uh, involve different uh, uh, university and uh, research, research center in Italy that wants to uh, care of this uh, underwater topic. Uh, that's all from our side. Thank you for uh, your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Alessio, for this presentation. And now, if we are ready, we will move to the next presenter, who is uh, Pierre Drap uh, from uh, well, uh, Marseille oh. University. Excuse me? <laughs> Alessio, can you please close your. Okay.
Okay, Pierre Drab from Marie Marcel Université and CNRS, and he will give us a long presentation uh, on ontology based underwater photogrammetry. Pierre, are you ready? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see yeah, the, yeah. the screen? The screen. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. So, um, uh, thanks for, for, for this, uh, this uh, event. It's very good idea. It's very uh, interesting to meet the community. So, uh, we want to, uh, to speak about uh, what about after we survey. Because, um, yes, we are a lot of people uh, see a show how to survey and uh, how it's difficult. But we want to focus uh, just right now uh, on uh, what, what are we doing with, with the, the survey. So what are we surveying for? Um, out of the, the item I can write on my, on my slide here, I, uh, we think the, the main important thing is uh, um, is knowledge is uh, we are serving to answer a question and to to increase the knowledge about the, the seats inside we are we are serving. Um, we will see uh, this about a free uh, free small example. What about the serving a red coral in Mediterranean? Um, the, the work we do with uh, you know, on uh, Malta with uh, uh, John and uh, and Carrie about the Slendy wreck. And uh, an artificial reef uh, in Marseille, we are starting to, uh, to study. We are using tools, uh, IR, VR, we are, uh, and we are using um, ontology in, in order to manage and to, uh, to manage the knowledge we have about uh, the site we are, we are serving. I mean, underwater archaeology, uh, biology, and things like that. Because we want, we, we want to, uh, to make a link, a close link with the people we are uh, we are working on. I mean, biologists. biologist. I'm not biologist. I don't know nothing about coral, for example. We we uh, work on uh, from uh, ten years now on the red coral in Mediterranean Sea, and uh, here the problem of uh, knowledge of coral is uh, uh, they are in the head of the biologist, and it seems complex because they are working on. It. So uh, we just try to use uh, uh, geometry uh, of us, of what we are serving. To, uh, to help biologists to, uh, to uh, uh, infer new data, to, uh, to, go, uh, to go beyond the, the survey we done. We want to uh, extract the, the skeleton, for example, to try to uh, make, to uh, propose a new representation of the, of the uh, branches of coral in order to uh, ex explain and, and express um, by biomass and things like that. So, for example, here knowledge extraction is, is done not with, uh, uh, from books, but from geometry. And we try to, uh, to uh, manage this knowledge and to link with the survey we, we, we've done and with the 3D model we are, we are doing. But this is uh, uh, about uh, 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 such complicated thing because uh, um, nature and biology, uh, we don't have a theoretical plan and uh, it's, uh, we just have to discover this. But we are working uh, since uh, a lot of years now, more than 10, with Timmy Gamin and uh, John Moore and Carrie uh, on this uh, uh, amazing break and uh, the amazing, amazing uh, work they are doing. We have survey of this site since uh, 2009 and uh, since uh, 2006, 17, 16 perhaps, uh, they are they are excavating. So the problem with uh, uh, bio, uh, with um, archaeologists when they uh, make excavation is that destroy the site. So uh, we need very good uh, documentation, and this is done accurately with the with the team. Uh, each day there is a survey, uh, a photographic survey, making the, the best uh, condition possible. What we are doing now is. Um, uh, managing with this documentation because we have a lot of documentation from a lot of years and we want to uh, a tool uh, and a lot of tools uh, in order to uh, to access this documentation and prove the, and, and we use uh, 2D interface from with web and so on and uh, 3D interface in order to access the knowledge and to refer new knowledge so we already publish a lot of job about uh, um, uh, B-dimensional and uh, web uh, approach about uh, for managing this uh, this uh, timeline. 
uh, survey. And uh, we add to the survey uh, uh, representation of the complete representation of the Arthora according to the typology the archaeologists give us. For example, we have uh, on the center of the slide here a complete uh, model of an, uh, an Arthora, which is uh, measured. red. You see the, the, gray, the gray part of the of the Arthora is gray because it's a uh, uh, scene, and the, the the orange part is hidden by the sediment. So the, the system is able to uh, complete according to uh, uh, theoretical uh, information and hypothesis uh, complete uh, Arthora. Uh, and we have attached to this a lot of data, and we want to uh, access to this data from 2D interface or 3D interface. What we propose uh, now uh, and uh, since, uh, since uh, a few months, uh, a few months, it's uh, a small, uh, a small um, application uh, based on uh, Air Core and uh, OpenCV and Unity, which is a very small one and easy one to use because it, you, it's uh, Android uh, things. You can you can uh, download it already. This is not the um, it's a it's a, a draft of the application. The group one will uh, will be accessible. Mm, at the end of the month, I think. So it is um, uh, built on the, on air core. So it's a air uh, approach, but uh, the device is uh, seeing uh, by the camera the real world and show you the the virtual world. So you can move on trendy moving your camera because the slam uh, made by by air core is able to uh, to uh, repeat the movement of the, of the device to the movement to the, the, the icon. Of course, inside this application, you can access to all the, the, the surveying we have. You can choose the years, you can choose the, see the, the state of the, of the site in 2009, 2014, and so on. And you can see the change changing. Uh, you don't move and, the, and you have an access to the uh, timeline of, uh, of the sighting from this position. As we have also the, the 3D model of the Alphara, you have access to the data we have, and uh, we have a lot of data uh, uh, organizing with uh, ontology, and we have an access from the from the small uh, application here to the ontology server on the on the lab. So for the moment, it's uh, it's, it's uh, uh, reduced as you know, the query are not very well. Uh, developers because uh, uh, we have got time and this project is not funded for it. But we will uh, improve this, uh, this uh, query management of, uh, of the application. Because we use ontology because um, uh, I think it's, uh, we think it's, uh, it's the best way to, uh, to manage knowledge which are not fixed. Which are not, because knowledge in, uh, in archaeology uh, is always changing. The, 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 the knowledge we, you have on site is changing at every um, at every uh, day, at every excavation, every year. So the the things you know are changing. It's like in the real life. So if you have a, a rigid database, we are not able to uh, to um, to monitor the changing of the knowledge, and not only the changing of the site of the morphology. So this is able to uh, to managing uh, concept and to managing concept which are uh, alpha, for example, but also relationship uh, from uh, uh, one one year to another and one concept to another. Um, the, la the last one is uh, the last one is uh, artificial reef in Marseille. It's uh, just uh, a toy for the for the moment. It was uh, very interesting for the uh, diving part because it's a big area. And uh, we use the same kind of uh, application with the uh, IR, IR system. And uh, the application is already uh, downloadable uh, at the address here. And uh, you can here only, um, only move on the other side and, uh, and uh, see the site as you are more or less uh, in, on, on the site. What we can say uh, um, using this IR and VR tools, um, let's say let's say let's say clearly the things. Tools are like this are boring. So if people are, are using this and about something like thirty seconds, one minute, no more. And after they they give me back, uh, the tablet and say very interesting. 
So what we try to do is uh, connecting with other things. Here we don't have other things. We, have, we, we add fishes, for example. We add fishes which are completely fake uh, and make in Unity. And it's uh, people look the fish. Okay? The, the, the only fake things is, uh, look like interesting. So uh, we try to uh, make this attractive. And uh, this, I think, is the only way to make this attractive is to give uh, sense and to add semantic to this kind of, uh, of survey. And um, uh, the last thing is, uh, we are working also on, uh, on uh, VR. And uh, we just try now to use the, ne the, the, the new uh, real engine, uh, um, uh, Unreal Engine, which is the 5.0. Uh, the, the, the impressive uh, things of this uh, engine is uh, it can manage directly cloud, cloud of point and not uh, texture and mesh. Because uh, one of the uh, on the on the other on the other example you you, you saw, uh, you see only a mesh which is poor uh, geometry uh, uh, poor geometry because uh, the device is not supporting a lot of uh, uh, memory and uh, and triangle and things like that. With this kind of uh, engine, we can support a billion of points, and we can uh, uh, not lose uh, the geometry. And we can also add all the functionality we have, so timeline and uh, picking objects and uh, linking with uh, ontology and things like that. So we are working uh, currently on this uh, kind of uh, approach. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre, for this very interesting presentation. And uh, we will move uh, forward to the next presenter, uh, Robin Lofalski from the Institute from applied, of, for Applied Photogrammetry and Informatics of JD University of, uh, in Oldenburg, in Germany. And he will give us a pitch presentation on the group uh, activities. Robin, are you here? Yeah. Can you see my screen here? Yeah, it's not on full screen. Oh, is it not? No. Okay. So. I'm sorry, something is not working here. I hope I can figure it out here. Okay. Um, so, I hope it works now. Yeah, it's, again, it's not, okay, now uh, it's on Perfect, okay, yeah, I'm start. sorry for the delay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my name is Robin Lofotsky, as uh, you mentioned already. Um, I'm with uh, Thomas Luhmann's group at uh, Yard University in Oldenburg. I'm a research assistant. And I would just give you a couple of um, insights on the things that we um, did a couple of last years, especially on um, our blue ROV, as um, Rusty told us earlier today. Um, so we are based all our um, developments basically on um, the blue ROV and um, developed in small multi-camera system with a concluding of uh, three cameras. So two facing forward, one facing backwards, the navigational tasks. Um, so um, what you can see on the top is basically uh, version one and uh, we're currently building on version two, which uh, extends the first part, um, but uh, bases on an own framework because uh, the one that Blue, R that Blue Robotics provided uh, is a little too small for what we actually need. And um, we'll include uh, the short baseline positioning, um, two IMUs, um, some um, water sensors for uh, conductivity, temperature, and, and pressure measurements. And it's also going to be um, standardized interfaces. So we use subcon connectors that um, basically fit to most of uh, the ROVs that are currently being used in professional and in um, the lower small uh, hobby scale and uh, is uh, employing RS-232 communication and uh, should be integrated into other ROVs as well quite easily. So um, just dimensions are pretty much the same as uh, the blue ROV. And uh, we used that one in um, the Indian Ocean 
uh, two years ago. So we um, teamed up with uh, the co our colleagues from Curtin University, um, especially Petra Helmholtz, who um, taught a uh, talk yesterday, I think. And um, we investigated on artificial reefs in the Indian Ocean. So um, what they did there is I uh, think a couple of, of them, maybe some know already. So um, we uh, went to the uh, cities of Bunbury and Dunsborough and uh, basically um, photographed and observed these um, concrete structures uh, with our blue ROV and our camera system. So it's basically looked as you can see down here. And um, this worked actually quite well, but uh, during our uh, investigations, especially uh, during analysis with uh, SFN structure uh, software, we uh, found that m mostly of our um, images are usually filled with background here. So, and um, when this comes into dense matching, especially in uh, Argosoft Metashape, which we used, uh, we found that um, the not matchable background usually um, distorts our um, resulting point cloud. So this is uh, why we employed uh, image masking automatically. We um, went up and uh, used um, one implementation uh, that bases on uh, image processing algorithms and one that bases on the uh, machine learning algorithms. And basically uh, ran with these masking areas. So basically black ones not being matched, the uh, bright ones being matched and ran this through the same um, pipeline and found that this uh, helps a lot in um, in the 3D structure, uh, especially uh, reducing noise, as we could see here. Though uh, it definitely does not say um, which uh, um, procedure is more powerful. It just is an example of what uh, image masking can do if uh, these problems occur in, if, for example, on the water photometry. And the uh, third part is a bundle implementation, which I'm working on right now. It's um, so this is already uh, we developed uh, a bundle implementation on the um, maybe known service solver, which is, was developed by uh, some people from Google. And uh, what makes this very great for us is actually the flexibility in it. So it makes us uh, quite easy to integrate new camera models or so different camera models and um, basically run the same bundle procedure over and over again. Uh, we implemented it uh, right now three quite notable and a couple of more. Um, uh, models of interior orientation, mostly um, the ray tracing algorithm that uh, Christian Molzer talked about yesterday and then on one that is uh, pretty much based on that and uh, um, enables us to have a high performance with data from SFM and from standard photogrammetry software. And um, we evaluated this in the water tank that we got at our institute, um, mainly on uh, focusing on the um, intersection angle from the camera with the um, with the interfaces, um, especially showing us that uh, rectangular show, um, setups as has been shown in some other literature as well, mostly does not rely, have to rely on ray, tra on ray tracing or explicit modeling, while some um, just sl already slight uh, tilting towards the interface uh, makes a lot of difference here. So and just um, this will be published hopefully by the end of this year, which gets me to the end of my presentation. Um, this is uh, already, as you probably have seen already, a call for papers at the PFG in Germany. So um, well, um, my uh, boss, Thomas Luhmann, um, basically is a guest editor at, uh, for this special issue. Um, and if you're interested in publishing on multimedia or on the water photogrammetry, this uh, might be an option for you. The uh, deadline notably is on 20th of August, so it's still plenty of time and uh, will be published by the end of this year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. And um, now I would like to welcome the next presenter, who is uh, Fabio Mena from the 3D Optical Metrology Unit of Fondazione Brusno Kessler uh, in Italy. And he's also chairing this working group, uh, devoted also a lot of time in organizing uh, this meetup. He will give us a long presentation about the group activities. Fabio, the screen is yours. Fabio, we cannot hear you. Maybe you have to turn on your microphone. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you can see also myself now. Okay, uh, thanks, Panos. Uh, uh, this is a very quick overview of the underwater photogrammetry research activities uh, I do at uh, Tridom FBK, but I must say that uh, this uh, 
are uh, all done together with the other colleagues uh, at the international level. And I want to take the, the, the occasion here to express my gratitude to all of them, to their very, uh, really priceless con contributions. Uh, Tridom is, uh, is um, a research unit uh, from uh, the Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Trento. We are about 15 researchers, including researchers, including uh, four PhD and ex ex external collaborators. We have expertise in photogrammetry, uh, vision, 3D metrology, and we do applied research work in uh, industrial metrology, 3D mapping, geomatics in general. Uh, this we do, we do this in different environments, and of course, uh, among them, uh, we uh, also work in uh, uh, work underwater. Over the past uh, years, uh, we um, have been uh, uh, working on, uh, on a surveying technique that could solve the problem of, uh, of surveying a floating object. So that's a quite difficult task to do with the other techniques because it's a dynamic, it's a dynamic environment and uh, there is uh, the object that is half underwater, half above the water. Uh, we applied this technique then to the case of the Costa Concordia, which uh, by the way was not floating at all. And then we improved the technique and refined it by using a, um, a lightweight stereo camera that uh, we used uh, with, the, with the camera above the water and the camera below the water. And then we, do, we did the two separate uh, surveys using the same stereo camera to uh, do the, the, the separate survey. And the link was done by, by the, the exterior or relative orientation known of the stereo camera. Um, you can see on the bottom right corner the, the publication that uh, summarizes uh, most of these uh, uh, techniques. And this was done together with, uh, with, uh, with Erika. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, of course, we also uh, did a lot of work in camera, uh, underwater camera system calibration. Uh, how do different camera housing system perform underwater? How much does lens port misalignment affect the accuracy? I, I saw there is a lot of discussion going on in, on, in the chat. Uh, so the question we posed to ourselves was, uh, this, is it always necessary to use an extended camera model? So we worked with both uh, rigorous modeling and uh, by implicit modeling of these, uh, um, these parameters. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, we uh, summarized the work uh, in, the, in the two publications you can see uh, down in the slide. Um, we know that uncompensated systematic errors affect the global deformation of the 3D model. Sometimes uh, they show up as a systematic effects if the camera network is uh, uh, geometrically strong enough. Um, and uh, we uh, show the difference between uh, uh, rigorously modeling the refraction effects or by leaving, for example, the centered domes up to 30 millimeter with respect to the center of the, of the dome. And I invite you to um, participate to the, to the positive discussion of Erika at the next uh, Congress, uh, virtual Congress in, uh, in Nice. Uh, then uh, currently we're working also to uh, Vislam underwater. Uh, for us it's very important because uh, uh, to attain a, a specific accuracy, uh, a specific camera network is necessary. And also to guide the uh, diver or the ROV, uh, the ROV, um, it is very important to know the distance in real time, to understand uh, if uh, uh, the, the, the overlap is enough, if, uh, if the side lap is enough. And this is to optimize the survey, but also for safety reasons in case of divers, uh, because we know that we have a limited bottom time underwater, but it's also, it is also very important for industrial applications because time uh, means money. And uh, as we did in, um, in these applications in, uh, with the colleagues from Marseille and uh, when I was at the COMEX for one year, uh, we worked on uh, improving the accuracy of uh, the Islam um, techniques because uh, one day of uh, su a support vessel at sea can cost uh, even $250,000. So time is very important. Having uh, uh, a feedback uh, in real time, it's something that is, uh, is nowadays very, uh, uh, very uh, important. 
Um, and then uh, we translated these to portable devices. Uh, we have uh, recently developed a portable system that runs uh, uh, VSLAM and some guidance we uh, developed uh, using uh, ARM, uh, low power ARM uh, devices like the Raspberry Pi 4 and uh, uh, normal mobile phone. And on this, we are uh, um, implementing, thanks to the collaborations also with the, with the, the other colleagues uh, from Marseille, we're developing uh, um, uh, real-time uh, image mosaicing, uh, also to show the coverage uh, that, uh, that is uh, uh, um, increasing in, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the field uh, in, in real-time. And this is also something that we would like to implement, for example, in the in a project we have in Antarctica where bi marine biologists are still using transects like this, they have to set up uh, uh, the, the tape uh, to, uh, not to get lost underwater and to understand what they need to, to, to survey every, every year. And last but not least, uh, this is uh, a, a work I'm uh, going to present as a poster next uh, month in uh, Nice. Uh, here, um, we, uh, during the last two years, we have been working on integrating a pressure sensor on, uh, on the, in the photogrammetric processing. And in this paper, we uh, describe uh, how to uh, compute the lever arm offset between the, the center of the pressure sensor and the optical center of the camera, and how to uh, uh, do this in a bundle adjustment implementation. And uh, um, we tested this uh, method in two real cases in a Garda Lake at 50 meter depth. We use this method to level and to scale the, the, the survey. We compare this, uh, the scaling from the pressure sensor with uh, some scale bars and other targets on the, on the bottom. And we reached a, a scaling accuracy better than one millimeter over one meter distance. Um, and this has also very uh, huge potential for, for um, leveling the survey. Uh, the precision is in the order of a few cents of the grip. Uh, um, and this, we reached uh, this scaling accuracy also at the sea uh, when, with, the wave, with the swell and wave condition of uh, 15 centimeters uh, wave height. Uh, I think it's, uh, that's all from my side. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Fabio, for this presentation. And if you can stop sharing your screen, great. Uh, now let's move to the last but not least presentation for today. Mikhail Bleier from the Department of Computer Science of University of Wartburg. And he will give us a speech presentation about the group activities. Uh, Mikhail. Thanks, Panos. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Cool. So, hi everyone. I'm Michael. I'm from the telematics group in Würzburg. Um, we are traditionally interested in a broad topic of point cloud processing and mobile mapping topics. And about five or six years ago, we started to get also more interested in underwater projects. We are more located in the center of Germany, so we actually don't have the luxury to uh, go to the ocean that often to capture data. So we set up a little test tank on university grounds, um, which you can see here in the image, to have like at least 40 cubic meters of water around in a quite low cost DIY solution. And over the past five or six years, we started to have all the joys of the difficulties of capturing large underwater data sets and that everything you stick into water will break at some time. Um, we got involved in underwater topics mainly with the VAMOS project, which was a project in uh, underwater mining where like an underwater excavator remotely controlled was deployed from a floating platform and the challenges you go in here is that you can only remotely control the thing from a computer interface and camera images provide very little information. You basically just see the turbidity in front of you if you're doing mining in an inland mine. So one of the efforts in the project was to build a virtual reality based remote control solution. So we put uh, all sensor data into a consistent interface with like the bathymetry. We had positioning, acoustic information, 
and also like 3D sensors from like an ROV with a scanning a multi-beam sonar, which could be streamed live in the scene and also like the mechanically scanning multi-beam here on the bottom right of the excavator, as well as all the articulation of the cutting arm and so on. So to give the operator a good situational overview of the mining scene and help him with remote control. Then increasingly we got interested in optical metrology in water. So we built our own little low cost underwater laser scanner from like a lot of off the shelf parts. We employ there like a cross line pattern. So we project two lines in this scene as a cross. The idea mainly why we did that was that we could uh, have a bit independence of where we move the sensor so that we can measure by moving the sensor in different directions and have a more omnidirectional pattern which cover the scene. Another advantage is uh, also that we get like double measurement of every point in the scene. So we get multiple measurements, which helps you a lot to like do quality control on the scene because we get a measurement from two slightly different viewpoints for, from the two lines. And that uh, shows up quite well if you have some calibration issues that the measurements of the two line diverge. So we clearly see problems if we don't uh, explicitly also correct for the refraction on the flat port housing. We definitely see those issues, at least at the corners and edges of the measurement volume uh, as deviations, especially between the measurement lines. And if you wanna get into higher accuracy measurements. Um, what we're currently more interested in and doing is we are interested in topics of like scanning through the water surface. This has also some application in material sciences. So we're working with some material science people who want to scan like um, cell material, which has multiple layers and do very accurate measurements of that. And we currently test that in the lab with like some reference objects, which are basically just some Lego bricks covered in gelatin. So to have some objects with known geometry in there and then have the whole headache of um, uh, doing refractive modeling of the more complex surfaces and the different uh, ray geometry of the scanner. Another thing we are currently doing, which I won't talk about, is we're working towards a system for underwater mobile mapping from an ROV, where there was already a talk yesterday by Christian Breuer Burkhardt from Fraunhofer. So the idea of that project is to build an active stereo sensor, which doesn't only measure a few lines, but a whole measurement volume with very high update rates. And we want to work towards then actually doing mobile mapping with that and our group works there partially on like the visual odometry, visual SLAM and uh, 3D processing and SLAM on the 3D data of that sensor and we hope to go onto water with that sensor soon. So this was a very quick overview, a few of the topics we're working on and I hope I could give you a few ideas of what our group is doing. Thank you very much for your, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And uh, now we will uh, move forward to the question and answer session. So, uh, okay, Panos, so I'm going you... to, yeah, I'm going to present uh, the Slido. Yeah, actually, we don't have many questions regarding this session. We have just uh, two and they are both addressed to, to Rastom. The first one is, uh, did you finally manage to, to send the robot, the robot to Hawaii? Um, we really wanted to, we did build it. We sent it about 50 miles in the ocean. Uh, every time we ended up running into kelp beds that got it got tangled up in. And then we were selling a lot of thrusters and customers were actually paying for those. So we had to put that project on the shelf. Uh, for the future, but I would love to do it someday. Great. And the second question is, uh, are you planning to offer some subsea connector additionality, additionally to the penetrators and low cost options for the expensive subsea connector would be uh, of interest? Uh, 
yes, we are working on that, and we would love to do that. I know it's a really, it's a really big deal. It would be a game-changing uh, product for this industry and would enable you all to do a lot of cool things. So it's something that's on our list, but it's hard to do at a low cost. Yeah. So it takes a lot of work. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fabio, are we going to take the, um, the group screenshot? Yeah, I would like to try to take a, a screenshot. So I stop sharing and I switch to change layout and try to um, put as many thumbnail of your webcam as possible. Yes, that's very nice. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. Let's wait just a second. Oh, Godfrey, you're on the train. <laughs> I, okay, that's, uh, that's many more coming. I also want to thank Robin who just got vaccinated, I think, uh, before his presentation. I hope he feels, <laughs> he feels fine. Uh, okay, also Pierre, ah, that's, that's very nice, thanks. Okay, I will take one. Okay, let me save it. But we cannot see you, Fabio. Uh, that's uh, that's true. Let me let me take it again. Let's see. Where am I? Uh, because I'm sharing. No, I don't know why. Okay, I will I will uh, do some Photoshop. Uh. Now you're here. Now you're here. Okay. That's me. Yes. Let me take this screenshot again. Sorry. This is uh, quite a slow now, my computer. Okay, three, two, one. Let me paste it on this presentation here. Sorry if it's taking longer than I thought. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Okay, we can uh, quickly move to the next uh, to the next uh, session. Uh, we're running a bit late, but I think that uh, the presentations are uh, very, very interesting. And uh, I really thank you again all for being here. Uh, for many of you, it's, uh, it's quite, quite late. Um, okay, I'm going to, to present now my uh, tab here. I'll take this occasion to show the poll and start the next one. Let me put, I would ask you to kindly switch off the, yes, sidebar. Okay, that's it. Okay, I would start the next poll, please. Uh, uh, this is uh, about sharing the data set is, uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, that uh, we, we already uh, related to the previous one. And we can move now to the uh, last uh, session. And uh, this, uh, the next speaker uh, will be Alessandro Ridolfi. Alessandro, are you there? Yes, I found you. Okay. I will leave this poll on. Whenever you're ready, please.
You can share your screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, we can. We see the PowerPoint presentation. Now we see the full screen. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. So first of all, thank you very much, Fabio, for your kind invitation. I'm Alessandro Ridolfi from the University of Florence. Uh, the University of Florence in Italy is one of the universities of ISME, the Italian Integrated uh, Systems for Marine Environment uh, Interuniversity Center. Uh, so we, we belong to this pool of uh, university working on marine robotics. And in particular, at the University of Florence, my research group is composed of uh, um, 11 people at the moment. And our research focus is on um, autonomous underwater vehicles. So, um, I'll try to move on. Okay. So this is our uh, main platform at the moment. It is called the uh, Filippo AUV. It is an autonomous underwater vehicle. Uh, it is quite small with a simple logistics. Uh, so we can work with this kind of autonomous vehicle uh, very easily from a rubber boat or directly from uh, the shore. Uh, it is uh, fully autonomous and um, it is equipped with both um, acoustic and optical uh, payload. My research group, as I said, mainly works on the autonomous behavior of these kind of vehicles. So starting from a few slides about uh, navigation and motion planning, we recently developed a, a strategy for, uh, I would like to call it, uh, active uh, mapping so basically we can uh, have an area we want to cover and we can uh, decide the percentage of the area we want to cover with acoustic or optical payload and then we start the mission and the vehicle will select the next uh, best viewpoints and will map the area uh, in an autonomous way so in this slide we can see a, an example of a test we perform in La Spezia, Italy. So we wanted to cover the 90% of the black square in the map here on the left side. And in this case, the payload we focused on was a forward-looking sonar. And here on the right side, you can see in red, uh, the, the red line is the path followed by the vehicle. Uh, it was not set a priori, as I said, while in, uh, in red on the, on, the, on the sea map, you can see the amount of area we discover with the forward-looking sonar. And as I said, this is a, a, an active strategy for monitoring. So when the mission is over, we are almost sure that the percentage of the area we selected uh, was correctly uh, mapped. Just one final slide concerning navigation. Uh, we are now uh, assembling and then testing a, a module for uh, visual inertial odometry. So uh, in the framework of an Italian project, they asked us uh, to develop such a module to be mounted, uh, for instance, below the autonomous vehicle in order to enhance the autonomous navigation capability thanks to the support of uh, uh, optical payload. So we, we, we mounted four cameras in this case and uh, inertial, uh, inertial sensors. Talking about some perception activities, uh, we are not expert in uh, photogrammetry. Uh, at all. So usually we collect images and then we uh, collaborate with users uh, if this is the aim of uh, the campaign. But we, uh, the research group instead uh, is focusing on uh, uh, real-time processing. So we try to do uh, the most we can on board 
And recently, uh, we focused on automatic target recognition techniques, both on optical images and also on uh, sonograms. So, for instance, in this case, we had to find out and to geolocalize some targets of interest on the seafloor. Uh, so, recently, with the low cost hardware and with quite well known deep learning techniques, it is possible also on small autonomous vehicles to do uh, something like this. Uh, as I said, in, in real time. So when the mission is finished, we can uh, check immediately uh, the targets uh, founded by the, the vehicle. If we do not want to wait for the end of the autonomous mission, uh, we can have some communication or acoustic communication. Uh, in this slide, I reported one example of um, detection of uh, bubbles. So here we were in the Volcano Island in 2019 in Italy. And in order to study the acidification problem, we had to find out some bubbles. Uh, on the right side, uh, you, you can see, for instance, some detection of the bubbles. Uh, actually, here we were in, uh, in La Spezia, replicating, artificially replicating some of these uh, uh, kind of things. And uh, in, in real time, with our vehicle, we can uh, geolocalize uh, the, the bubbles through the forward-looking sonar or through the cameras. Uh, the reason, the, the very simple reason why we are working a lot with sonars is that, uh, unfortunately, we often work in areas, in sea areas, where the visibility is not, uh, is not so good. Um, we also have a, an autonomous surface vehicle, or if you prefer, a moving buoy, uh, in order to have an acoustic link with the autonomous uh, vehicle. So, we can have uh, some transferring of data from the vehicle to the buoy also during, uh, during the mission. Uh, otherwise, if we would like to have a real-time monitoring of what is happening underwater, we need a, a physical link. So, you can put a, a cable between the buoy and the vehicle. And if the mission is, is in very shallow water, we can also do something like that. Here on the right side, you can see our uh, uh, interface to look what is going on during the, the mission. With the payload, uh, we work, of course, on uh, well-known uh, 2D and 3D mosaicing and reconstruction. So, in this slide, you can see, for instance, on the left side, the 2D acoustic mosaicing uh, which is carrying out uh, in real time during the, the autonomous mission. Here on the right side, you can see uh, an example of the final mosaic. And uh, a, a recent activity uh, we, we started in 2020 is to um, perform, is to uh, build some 3D occupancy grid mapping and some uh, uh, even not very accurate uh, bathymetric analysis of the area we are uh, working on. So here, for instance, on the right, on the right side, you can see some uh, objects uh, coming out from the, from the seafloor. Uh, and after the acoustic uh, coverage, we can decide to look for, so in the classical approach of search and inspection mission, we can then uh, look for uh, specific targets with uh, cameras. Finally, uh, here you have some other results we collected in the Volcano Island. So the, let's say the the particular feature of this kind of mission is, was that it was in very, very shallow waters, so more or less one meter, on one meter and a half, with many uh, rocks coming out from the sea bottom. 
and the autonomous vehicle was basically uh, navigating on surface. So you have the acoustic mosaics here on the left side and the optical ones on, on the right side. And so I am here at the final slide. So these are basically the research topics of the research group. So development and testing of autonomous platform, uh, small ones, and they are customizable. So basically we can customize them uh, according to the needs of the, of the user, of the partners. Autonomous navigation and planning, autonomous perception, and more recently some uh, activities in underwater intervention, but uh, for the moment only in the field of the oil and gas sector. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Alessandro, for this uh, uh, very interesting uh, panorama of applications. Um, before uh, moving to the next speaker, I just want to uh, announced that I started a new poll. It's an open text poll. Uh, it's uh, what is the typical accuracy required by your application? Please answer with domain of application and the values in meters. For example, coral growth, one millimeter. Yesterday there was a uh, underwater uh, soldering. It was uh, a tenth of millimeter. Okay, then we can move to the next speaker. Uh, that is uh, with uh, Kimon Papadimitriou. Uh, Kimon, are you there? Hello. Good evening. Okay. So, uh, Iman, uh, I'm start sharing my screen. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Please, whenever you're ready. Nice. Give me this. And uh, let me know that it is okay, and uh, I can uh, start. Huh? Yes, I, I, I do see it. So uh, okay. please Thank go ahead. So uh, hello to all. Uh, good morning, good uh, evening. It's late afternoon in uh, Greece. Uh, now I start my presentation by saying that uh, I'm working as a teaching staff at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki uh, since uh, 2014. And uh, since uh, 2019, the lifelong learning center of uh, the university uh, offers an introductory course for the training of uh, divers in applied methods and uh, procedures for underwater surveying. And uh, the idea for such a course was uh, presented uh, firstly back in uh, 2015 during the ISPRS uh, CIPA uh, workshop uh, at uh, Italy. And right after this course uh, has been recognized by PADI as a distinctive specialty named underwater survey diver. And since then, uh, about uh, less, a few more than 20 students have been uh, certified. Uh, now, the aim of this course is to provide uh, basic knowledge and skills uh, for divers uh, and researchers. Uh, that are willing to participate in preparing and uh, implementing uh, underwater surveys, mostly for uh, 3D recording, and uh, concerning the learning objectives of this uh, uh, training is uh, the use of maps and uh, diagrams in underwater research uh, before or during the dive or after the dive, planning and organizing the underwater survey campaign, uh, develop skills uh, learn about procedures and techniques apply to, uh, that apply to underwater survey projects and recognize potential uh, problems, risks associated with uh, such works. And uh, a major part of this is to build uh, a team spirit among uh, the participants, uh, also with collaboration with people uh, probably at the surface. Uh, now you can see an overview of the topics of uh, this course. I'm not going to name them, but uh, just want to mention that uh, there are some uh, theory and some skills that uh, are developed and then are followed by the application in uh, real life uh, conditions. And uh, after the course, in such a way that after the course, uh, participants uh, are able to participate uh, in underwater survey projects. Uh, some uh, skills are developed uh, out of the water and uh, most of them in water. So there is uh, a lot of practice uh, uh, 
And uh, here you can see the last uh, group of uh, participants last uh, uh, October. Uh, after that, uh, it, we, we were expecting to have another course, but uh, the lockdown did not allow. Uh, fortunately, those students, after they have uh, been certified, they participated in their first uh, underwater survey uh, as part of uh, our laboratory fieldwork. Um, and that was actually the need for uh, us to start uh, providing such course to other people uh, because uh, we, uh, we have an extensive area to study, mainly looking and documenting uh, cultural heritage assets, uh, modern or ancient wrecks. And in this photo, you can see uh, three of the students. Uh, two of them are archaeologists, one uh, journalist, uh, the director of uh, our laboratory in the middle, and uh, another two surveyors, me and another one, uh, that are working uh, with the, the team. This course uh, is addressed to uh, scientists that will need to develop their underwater surveying skills or divers that are willing to participate uh, on a voluntary basis or in citizen science projects and so on. Uh, for this season, uh, it is not yet announced, uh, the course, but we're expecting to have this uh, probably at the mid-August or uh, maybe another one at uh, mid-October if the conditions are uh, okay. Uh, if you are interested, you can use the QR code and uh, get some details. And uh, thank you very much for this. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Kimon, for this uh, uh, very, very important uh, um, um, for putting all the efforts in this. I think uh, it was uh, it's it's very important, and I think appreciated from our community. Uh, I would uh, I would quickly move uh, to the next speaker, who is uh, Paolo Rossi. Paolo is uh, from the Department of uh, of Engineering and so Ferrari, University of Modena, Reggio Emilia. Uh, Paolo is going to give a pitch presentation about uh, the uh, their group activities. Uh, please, Paolo, whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, Fabio. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Oh yes, yes, uh, yes. We do. It's a PDF. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, it's okay. So good evening, uh, and this is the team of Geomatics Laboratory from the University of, of Modena in Reggio Emilia that is led by Professor Capo Alessandro and Mancini Francesco. Our activity mainly are uh, related to the surveying and the monitoring of both urban and the natural environment. So we use uh, GNSS system, laser scanning, photogrammetry, uh, SAR interferometry. A few years ago, we start a project in uh, underwater for the monitoring of coral growth in uh, French Polynesia, in Urea. And uh, we also cooperate with uh, Fabio and Erika Nocerino on this activity. And we were able to perform an eye accurate and high resolution 3D monitoring of the coral growth. And uh, to perform this uh, activity, what is required are uh, very good quality images and uh, also um, a repeatability through time of the uh, photogrammetric survey. For this reason, we propose, uh, we apply, a uh, follow a uh, strong and rigorous geodetic approach by installing markers on the seabed and by creating a geodetic network thanks to uh, underwater measurement of uh, oblique distances and age uh, differences. So we compute, we solve the network and we calculate in a local reference system the coordinates of the marker. This enables us to perform a direct comparison of the, of the generated 3D point cloud as shown in this slide. And as you can see from the vertical section, uh, you can appreciate the very high accuracy of the 3D products that is uh, about one millimeter level and also the high accuracy of the generated 3D model that is about uh, one centimeter more or less. 
and uh, it is allowed you to state uh, that if you see in this uh, section a growth that is bigger than one centimeter, this value is uh, significant and is real and not affected by or not related by error in the 3D model. This year, a few months ago, we start another experience with uh, other research from our university, the Electronic Laboratory and the Marine Biologist Laboratory. This project is named SIMBAD to survey and monitor a bioconstructor organism, the Cladocora and some species of Bourgogne. We are particularly interested in both the geometric monitoring and survey and also the biometric survey. In particular, from a biometric point of view, we are interested in fluorescence of this organism. In fact, uh, these uh, organisms can change uh, their uh, health status uh, related to the um, changes in the environment, such as temperature, salinity, and also uh, may be eaten by other predators, such as uh, the case represented on this, uh, in this image. And uh, so we want to check uh, both from a geometric point of view and uh, from a uh, fluorescent point of view what the change uh, in the organism. To do that, uh, we are going to customize uh, an underwater rov, the well-known Blue Robotics, with uh, high resolution camera with the housing provided by Easy Dive by Fabio, and also uh, with um, camera, uh, polarized camera with uh, focal filter in order to detect only the fluorescence of the organism. And in addition, we also need to use proper illuminator in order to uh, obtain a fluorescence answer. This is the very first uh, result of our activities. Uh, we are doing some tests in a laboratory. And uh, as you can see, we are using a blue light. And uh, the blue light is absorbed by this organism. And then the organism emits green light. And with uh, the polarized camera with a low pass filter, we are able to detect only the fluorescence, the fluorescence of the organism as you can see in uh, this uh, two picture. Obviously, we have a lot, uh, work, a lot of work to do uh, next month because we want to properly design the, the rob with the components mounted on. And also we need to choose, to make a proper choose on the illuminator, so the correct strength, the correct power. And also we need to work on the field of that, of that camera because we need to see more of the object. So for that reason, any collaboration, any advice from uh, these communities is very welcome. Thank you, Fabio, and thank you to everyone. Thank you, Paolo, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, we can move to the next speaker, which is Marinos uh, Lapos from Technical University of Cyprus. Uh, Marinos is going to give a long presentation about the IMARE Culture Project. Please, uh, Marinos, whenever you're ready, share yes, your screen. Just give me a second. Uh, no worries. In the meantime, I may stop uh, uh, the, um, the current poll and uh, run the other one, uh, which is uh, somehow related to, to the previous one. The question is, if your applications require 3D measurements over time, uh, for example, coral growth or AUV tracking, what is the re required frequency of the measurements? Uh, answer with the domain and time. Uh, for example, every 100 milliseconds, at least 10 seconds, three months, uh, one year, whatever. Okay. So, uh, so you see, can you see my presentation, the full screen? Well, yes. Okay. Yes, we do. Okay, great. So, um, my presentation today is uh, has to do with the IMR Culture Project. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Professor Dimitrios Carlados, who unfortunately is not able to be here. Um, the outline of the presentation, I'm going to give the context of the project. Then I'm going to talk about the Mazotos shipwreck that uh, was utilized uh, during the project. Then a few words about 3D modeling and texturing. 
that will be followed with uh, storytelling for dry visits in virtual reality applications. And then I'm going to give my conclusions. So, uh, IMR Culture was a European Union Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Actions uh, project uh, under the call of Virtual Museums and Social Platform on European Digital Heritage, Memory, Identity and Cultural Interaction. Uh, it was uh, one of the four out of 96 proposals that uh, granted funding uh, with a total budget of 2.7 million. Uh, euros and uh, it last it it began in November of 2016 uh, and lasted until January of 2020. So uh, in Amare culture, uh, we wanted to use virtual reality, augmented reality, and serious games in order to uh, promote maritime uh, underwater cultural heritage uh, through prolonged and personalized museum visits. Uh, in IMR culture, we used uh, three uh, sites for the, DRIA, uh, for the VR uh, dry visits. Uh, Zulendi uh, from Malta, a shipwreck at 110 meters underwater. Mazotos, which is located in Cyprus at 45 uh, meters underwater. And Bahia Archaeological Park in Italy, uh, where the depth uh, varies from 5 to 24 uh, meters. And from this, you can understand each side uh, had uh, its unique uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, now, a few words about Mazodos. I will not get into details regarding the backstory of the site due to the time constraints. Uh, regardless, from the beginning of the project, it was decided that we should present the undisturbed sites uh, for both shipwrecks, Mazodos and, uh, uh, and uh, Zlendi. Uh, despite the fact that the excavation teams had more recent and more detailed 3D models uh, in several phases. Therefore, for, Mazo for Mazodos, we had to rely on the only available data from 2007 when the wreck was initially recorded. recorded. Uh, but unfortunately, the 236 photos that were available were captured for a photomosaic, photomosaic creation and not for a detailed 3D model. Nevertheless, reprocessing those images in 2012 uh, with modern SFM and MVS techniques led to a geometrically correct orthophoto and a 3D model, but unfortunately with gaps that made it unsuitable for virtual reality. In 2017, though, we had to deliver a texture 3D model for the dry visits, uh, but um, as I said before, the undisturbed site uh, was uh, not existing anymore. Fortunately, on the following years, there have been excavation campaigns in an almost annual basis, uh, which meant that a lot of more 3D data and models have been gathered. Uh, therefore, we identified certain gaps in the initial 3D model, uh, and we stitched uh, and we filled these gaps with information gathered from the later 3D models, uh, creating a fully detailed uh, 3D model and an orthophoto. Later on, the, the model uh, was textured with the photos of the initial campaign from 2007. Uh, and here I need to mention that um, although we had created a full uh, 3D model, uh, we had to uh, decrease the number of uh, faces in it in order to make it suitable for a VR application. Uh, that uh, was the thing for all sites. Uh, but overall, we managed to provide uh, a model suitable for uh, virtual reality. Here you see sample 3D models from the Mazodos virtual uh, reality application. And now, uh, just a second, yes, uh, regarding the dry visit of Mazotos, the visit had, has eight points of interest uh, where the user may freely navigate and observe the wreck while at each point uh, he can read, hear, or even see additional information in most points. Um, he also has access uh, in additional 3D models which he can freely rotate and so on. Now, um, 
the examination of a 3D model with the, uh, the free my navigation, yes, addresses the personalized visit, but still it will be pretty boring for the public. And for that reason, we uh, storytelling um, played a huge role uh, during the development of the project. Um, storytelling, nevertheless, it's we consider it to be the best approach for mixing fun and education in a constructive manner. And for that reason, um, during the project, we realized that there is a critical difference among, among the two uh, shipwrecks that they were under ongoing excavations and Bahia. Specifically, Bahia has been a long studied site providing ample data and information such as conceptual 3D models, uh, and rock solid historical information, which allowed University of Sarajevo, one of our partners, to create a storyline supported by six short 360 videos, which they were uh, well embedded in the virtual world as the users may explore the surroundings by just uh, turning their head around. Um, in comparison, the dry visits on the shipwreck sites lack the necessary infor information for a robust uh, storytelling, where Bahia uh, didn't and uh, has been consistently more popular in all exhibitions and events that Aymara Culture took part in. Uh, to wrap up my presentation, um, some takeaway messages uh, from Aymara Culture. First, a 3D model needs to be highly decimated in order to develop a VR application, uh, but uh, a, a texture uh, needs to be uh, high detailed in order um, for the experience to be uh, good. Uh, the other takeaway message is that the most important aspect that we identified primary culture is the storytelling and the information which can be supported effectively by a team of creators uh, like the University of Sarajevo. The last thing I want to discuss is regarding to intellectual property rights. Specifically, I'm a culture being a non-profit consortium, we only had to deal with intellectual rights hence uh, acknowledge the, con the content creators at each stage. Uh, in fact, before each stage, the, cre uh, the creators must hand rights to the next ones and so on and so on. Now, if there was financial exploitation of the applications, the situation would uh, have been more complex and contracts should have been signed at each stage, allowing the investor to take uh, the full rights of the work. Although this is solved in um, cinema and fashion industry, the situation is more complicated, of course, in cultural heritage. Since the Department of Antiquities of each country usually retains uh, those rights. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would like to invite you uh, to the IMR Agriculture website. There you can find all the related publications and, of course, download materials like uh, uh, 3D models of ships uh, and games. Uh, also, you can find there the dry visits for headset mount displays such as HTC Vive or dry visits uh, that they are on the form at, they are in the form of uh, mobile applications. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks. thanks, Marinos, for this uh, very interesting overview and uh, for uh, <laughs> also. Uh, letting us with the, those messages, uh, also open messages, and for sharing uh, the last two pictures where uh, we don't know, we do not, the, we, we the, don't have the audience uh, having fun, but there's also some hard work. Uh, that we yeah, the, the first one was in 2019 in the Mazotos excavation where we, me and uh, Dimitris, we were loading some uh, bags of uh, sand. <laughs> uh, okay. The other one was from Bahia, the Argisopanos. Thanks, thanks. So let's move to the, to the next speaker, uh, Elena. Elena Prado, she's, uh, she's from Instituto Espanol de Oceanografia, Santander, Spain. 
and she's going to okay. give uh, each presentation about the habitat characterization, modeling, and monitoring all these kinds of applications they do there. Uh, and now, whenever okay. you're ready, please share your screen. Okay. Um, can you hear the, the see the presentation? And hear yes. Yeah? Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Fabio for the opportunity and happy to attend to this workshop and good afternoon everyone. Um, my English is quite awful so I apologize in advance and okay I would uh, like to tell you about underwater 3D models and deep learning algorithms to improve deep sea benthic species uh, characterization and vulnerable habitats mapping and monitoring. So the Spanish Institute of Oceanographic is a public research organization dedicated to um, research in marine science and, and fishing research. Uh, we are 700 people approx and we have an extensive geographic distribution with 10 oceanographic centers. We are here in, in the north of Spain in Santander City. Among um, basic functions are scientific research in, oce in oceanography and marine science, advice to the general state administration on fishing and marine policy, and represent of Spain in the international fishery and marine science organization. Uh, to do this, we have uh, different oceanographic systems, aquaculture facilities, and, and fleet. Um, one of the most important projects in this moment is Intemares. Intemares is a European life project and um, project aims to achieve uh, efficiently manage of marine Natura 2000 areas with the research as the basic tool for decision making. Among specific objectives, uh, can find improve the knowledge of the management of these marine protected areas and ensure a good conservation status for the different habitats and species of community interest. Um, we have to remember that the European Union Habitat Directive lists nine marine habitat types and 16 species um, if some of these habitat or species have been located, a marine site designation is required. So this site has to be declared a site of community importance and must be included in the, in the network. Our study areas are located um, mainly in the Cantabrian Sea, in the Bay of Biscay. And these are the areas three, Aviles Canyon System, um, El Cachucho Marine Protected Area is the first uh, marine protected area declared in Spain. And Cap Breton, this is a, this is a new possible area uh, to protect. And these areas are in depths out of the range and they have offshore zones like Simons Canyon and a steep slope. And so we need to sampling in, in deep sea. So as you know, uh, mine data source has multi beam echo sounder and underwater um, remote operate and vehicles. And this is an example. And here we can see uh, three examples of the 1170 habitat reefs in the directive in our uh, study areas in the Bay of Biscay. This is a batial zone at uh, 1000 meters of depth with a dense aggregation of a special starfish. And this is a um, cold water coral reef with uh, Madrepora oculata and Lophelia pertusa la, as a structural species at 850 meters depth. And finally, in this video, we can see a um, Gorgonian forest. It's an animal forest 
in El Cachucho Marine Protected Area at uh, 560 meter depth. So, uh, despite the ecological interest of this type of deep habitats, uh, there are still many gaps in the knowledge about them, mainly due to the difficulty of access and sampling or at this depth. So we need to increase the knowledge about deep sea vulnerable habitat. In this framework, we use the advantage of 3D models and deep learning approach to resolve questions about these sea benthic species. For example, a description of size and shape, morphometric parameters and population structure, abundance of specimens of, for each species, density or basic uh, biological data like age, growth ratio or mortality. And finally, mapping distribution of vulnerable deep sea habitat in large scale. So here we can see some studies based on 3D modeling and deep learning. And these studies uh, have been carried out to try to resolve some of these uh, use, uses I have just mentioned. For example, uh, in this study, we use 3D point clouds to extract a digital surface model at a centimetric level. And from, from it, we, we extract ter terrain variables or terrain descriptors as a slope, aspect, or bathymetric position index here. And with deep learning algorithms, uh, uh, use deep learning algorithms to identify and label species in the, mat in the mates uh, automatically, in an automatic-like way. And all of these data are used uh, as input data to generalize additive model for benthic microhabitat suitability mapping. So these statistics, statistics models can generate suitability maps and, and predict the probability that appear in the study areas this type of benthic microhabitat. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for your very detailed uh, presentation. Uh, let's move to the next speaker, who is uh, Bertrand Chemisky uh, from uh, Marseille. And Bertrand is going to uh, present a uh, pitch uh, presentation about uh, optoacoustic integration on a small ROV for underwater navigation and target detection. Uh, Elena, could you please stop share, sharing your uh, screen? Okay. Uh, Bertrand, whenever you're ready. Yes, okay. Um, thank you, Fabio. Thank you for this opportunity to participate uh, to this uh, congress. And so I just start to share screen. Uh, okay, you see the, my, my screen? Okay. Uh, yes, I see the PowerPoint presentation, not in full screen. But if you, yes, yes, okay, okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm Bertrand Chemisky, so I'm uh, I work uh, uh, with uh, Erika and Pierre in uh, at Marseille University and uh, Imagine Model and uh, a model uh, team, uh, so in um, uh, in Marseille. Um, I just uh, quick present our work on uh, auto acoustic uh, solution. Uh, integrated in a very small and uh, lightweight ROV for target identification and recognition. So, uh, uh, just about the underwater target uh, identification is still a challenge uh, due to the fact that uh, generally, and we have a different multiple phases in the uh, in this target recognition. Uh, first, search, detection, identification maybe intervention, and all those uh, phases are usually uh, done uh, using several vehicles. Uh, you can take the example of mineware applications. 
uh, where we have a surface ASL for the uh, target uh, detection, and then ROV or AV for uh, identification, and maybe ROV, other ROV or uh, ROV for, uh, for intervention. So uh, the main uh, difficulties is the uh, target positioning to be sure to uh, come back to this target and uh, to work on it. So uh, this uh, extensive search area um, is a limitation if we want to use only video cameras. Uh, if we use only video cameras, we will uh, take maybe too much time to find uh, the target and um, maybe too restrictive to to, to optimize this uh, this uh, comeback phase on the target. So that's why we imagine to uh, combine the two sensors, uh, the optical sensors and an acoustic uh, forward looking sonar. Um, so we using the sonar, we first detect. Uh, when the ROV arrives on the bottom, we first detect the, uh, the target and uh, with uh, tracking uh, aid the pilot to come on uh, close to the target. Then we can uh, start and use the uh, stereo cameras uh, data to maybe notification on 3D reconstruction. But the combination of these two sensors uh, required first calibration to determine the um, relative orientation between these uh, both sensors. So that's why uh, that's part of our activities uh, during uh, last month. And to, to do that, we integrate these two types of sensors on a low cost and lightweight platform. Uh, so we maybe yeah, just move the camera to show you the, uh, I don't know. So you should I mean, see the, the ROV here. It's a so, robotic. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's uh, Blue Robotics uh, ROV uh, in, uh, in last presentation. And so our solution is based on off-shelf components, and the software architecture is quite open, uh, using multi environments, and uh, to allow with modularity uh, for, for future works and, uh, and educational works. Um, so just about the integration, uh, to extend the capabilities of the ROV uh, using multiple uh, sensors, we just modify a little the ROV using a specific uh, power supply and uh, fiber optic data link uh, to allow the large uh, bandwidth of data uh, than in the uh, original position. So just about the uh, forward looking sonar, uh, we uh, can see that it's, uh, the sonar is just divided the, the area, volume uh, in the area uh, in multiple beam. And uh, we have the notion of angular resolution, uh, which is uh, just an issue in elevation axis because uh, we have very poor resolution in elevation. And uh, that can be an issue for uh, target location uh, in, in 3D. So, just to have the same reference frame between the two sensors, we just on an optoacoustic calibration, uh, we deployed several optoacoustic targets. Here we can see five targets. Uh, when we power process, we need only four. So have enough redundancy, we use five. Um, and uh, so we use uh, 3D reconstruction to locate the camera's position. And we use these uh, locations to, uh, to estimate the auto acoustic quality orientation using seven parameters and the transformation. So, thanks for your attention. Maybe just a quick view of targets here. That's another uh, for future works. To use specific design targets 
intro here uh, for future um, on field applications. Because here you can see some cool calibration. But the idea is to use this uh, calibration methods in, uh, in the field. Uh, so. So Thanks a lot, Well, very interesting. I think uh, we can move to the last speaker. Um, he was uh, he, he he asked me to 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 join the event uh, the other day. So we 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 welcome uh, uh, Michael Gromer from uh, uh, Bebun uh, Hydro Power, who is going to give a pitch presentation on their applications in uh, inspection of uh, hydro power. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, I do. Please. Very well, thank you. Okay, so um, I work for Verbund, which is Austria's largest um, electricity provider and operates roughly 130 hydropower plants. And in the last couple of years, there was a digitalization project in which we also try to or also do inspections of, of submerged parts of hydropower plants. And I will present some of them in a quick presentation. I will talk shortly about our ROV and inspections in storage power plants. Then about laser inspections, which are used to detect um, errors in, and defects in turbines, and about telescopic camera we use for run of river power plants. Here we can see the ROV, and also one of the biggest power plants, it's, um, it's a big storage in the Alps. Also doesn't have a sea, but luckily we have these big lakes, and here we can use it. Um, these are some images which were taken in this power plant at about 200 meters depth. It's, it is the, the base drain and the inland rake. This is also necessary for the authorities. We have to do inspections in, in certain intervals. And this was done with the ROV from the, pitch, from the picture before. Um, yes, this is sometimes rather challenging because these structures are pretty big. For example, the inner drake has an area of over 100 square meters and we have to make sure that every part is, is captured. There are also laser tests going on. Here we are still in a pretty, we are in, a, in, a, in a starting phase, we can see tests that were done with a, with a crawler and a laser was mounted on it to, um, to measure the turbine blades and to detect defects from cavitation. This was also done with an, uh, with an, with an industry partner. Another part which is useful for the smaller power plants, there are also lots of them in the rivers, um, is, is a telescopic camera which is mounted on a, on a 12 meter pole and is used to, to inspect submerged park, parts because it's, it's always very, it's a big effort to drain, especially on the big power plants in, in the Danube River. And if, if we can, if we have to drain them less often, then that's very, that's very good, good effect. Um, here we can see a 3D model, which was created from pictures from this camera. And also it is pretty easy to, to handle and one person is, is enough. I am already almost at the end. To give a quick outlook, um, we want to get further into this topic and, and explore more possibilities in, in laser and camera sensory, also photogrammetry to compare the, the models over the years and 
to be able to do predictive maintenance and only to uh, to train the system when it is really necessary and not to do it in fixed intervals as it is the case now. Also, I will do the, my PhD under the supervision of, of, of Gottfried Mandelburger. And here you can see uh, also the link to, to the sketch mode model, uh, which was of the wall, which is shown before. So thank you all for your attention. And yes, that was it. Thank you, Michael, for this very interesting overview of applications of underwater photogrammetry in the Alps. Uh, we have come to the end of this uh, second day. I would uh, thank all the speakers and presenters and, and um, the participants to, to stay up till the end. I understand that uh, um, it's late, so I'll make it very short. I'm going to now present uh, the results of the polls. Where we can see uh, the last, uh, we can stop the, the polls. Uh, there are no question and answer. <laughs> You're exhausted, I understand. Um, and uh, um, I think uh, I will leave these uh, polls on and uh, and so that you can check uh, check them uh, later and also tomorrow if you find i will restore all the questions and uh, will um, so that if you if you want you can uh, you can uh, um, you can ask uh, and you can uh, answer the the question um, there was very very nice reaction from your side uh, to this call uh, there was uh, almost uh, one month ago when we send this invitation and you answered uh, uh, very quickly uh, the last day actually everybody wanted to participate and that was a lot of work for me but uh, i mean I, I i really wanted to 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 do this together with the mark and pa panagiotis uh, and uh, dimitrios so i want to thank you all again and uh, now i'm going to stop this uh, video recording and um, I would uh, kindly ask you uh, to, to, to think about uh, sharing your presentations as Erika did and so that's it. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all again for, uh, for, uh, for uh, these efforts. I will stop recording now. It's going on. <laughs>